Want to stay ahead of fraudsters and across the latest scams? At which we helped prevent an estimated £1.8 million in scam losses last year thanks to our Scam Alert newsletter. And each week we provide more information on the latest scam activity, helping protect you, your family and your friends. Stay in the know and avoid falling victim to scammers by joining over 450,000 people already signed up to our free Witch Scam Alerts. To join them, head to witch.co.uk slash scam alert and sign up today. Hello and welcome, I'm Harry Kind. And I'm Lisa Webb, sitting in for Grace Farrell this week. And this is Get Answers, for living your best consumer life. When life gives you questions, which Get Answers. Lisa, lovely to have you here. Listeners might recognise your lilting tones from representing Witch on TV and radio, but your day job is pretty cool too. I think it is. Yeah, so by trade, I'm an editorial lawyer. So I work at Witch in the legal team. We do loads of stuff. I think people might be surprised to hear that we have lots and lots of companies who don't like what we say about them. And so I'm that sort of first line of defence against those companies. So I work really closely with our content and our research teams to make sure that everything we we publish is defensible and accurate. Which makes this podcast very easy to get sign off on. It, we've got the legal right here in house. We are very lucky to have you. Thank you. Because this week on Get Answers, we're talking about the future of scams. People kind of spend hours talking about the latest developments in tech, whether it's a big iPhone launch or breathless chat about the impact of AI. But there's a trillion dollar industry that doesn't get nearly as much attention for its constant innovation, and that is fraud. Today, we're going to treat the scammers like they're Steve Jobs or Bill Gates and give you the inside scoop of the latest developments in crime so that hopefully we're all a bit better equipped to stop them. And I can think of no one better to help with that than the brilliant Nick Stapleton. By day broadcaster and journalist, by night he's the scourge of the scammer. You probably know him from BBC Scam Interceptors. Nick, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Should we start with getting some of the rage out of the way? We've actually just been talking while setting up about scammers, about you know the victims that we've spoken to, and a lot of the nonsense out there about who are scam victims. Any kind of rants you want to get off your chest about that? I've got a rant. Yes. I get really annoyed about the way the conversation around scam victims is framed in this country. So I think... The most common response I see almost on social media or otherwise to, to the show is people saying the exact phrase, I don't know how they could be so stupid. And this just annoys me endlessly because ultimately, A, it's incredibly complacent, B, it's victim blaming, and it's kind of the last bastion of acceptable victim blaming, I think, the world of scams. I see that so often, and I just think, how can you be so complacent as to think that it's people being stupid that leads to this? That is just absolutely not the case. And you would never do this if it was someone being burgled. You wouldn't say, oh, you, how could you be so stupid as to get burgled? Why is this any different? Uh, without saying you're asking for it, you are setting yourself up for a fail to say that only the stupid can be caught by a scam. I mean, would you say that you're unscammable, Lisa? No, not at all. And the thing is, I work with this on a daily basis and I have come so close to getting scammed. It hasn't happened to me yet, but I'm always saying yet because there's always an opportunity. There's always a chance it'll happen. But we speak to people all the time who have been scammed. And so often it's people who I think ordinarily you wouldn't have expected. And we've all got this idea in our heads of, oh, you know, it's going to be someone older. It's going to be someone who's not as tech savvy. And very often those are the people who, like you say, get blamed for being the victim. But actually we see things like parents, those high mum WhatsApp scams that we talk about so often. You know, you've got someone who might be in their 30s that's received a WhatsApp and very often what it is, it's about how much you're concentrating in that very moment, in those 10 seconds where you receive the message. Are you particularly stressed at that time? Are you particularly busy? Because that's got such an impact on it. But the thing that really, really frustrates me, I think, is the fact that the Crown Prosecution Service, the police, they don't treat this the same way as other crimes. And I think that's really, really apparent, for example, with the Crown Prosecution Service. They don't consider sort of small fry crimes where it's only a few hundred quid being nicked as being as important to prosecute. 
It's nasty. I mean, we always talk about the the stat that fraud is something like 40% of all crime is maybe 1% or 2% of police resources and has just this attitude of, oh, well, never mind. It's a very, very minor crime. I mean, have you got any advice, almost psychological advice? What would you say to people who've, who've been scammed? I think by far the most important thing is to try and be comfortable talking about it with other people because the more that the victims of scams feel comfortable engaging the more they'll feel comfortable seeking advice, the more open conversations we can have about this. And hopefully then the less complacent other people will be because the more we can make this just an honest conversation around you know, how people get scammed, why it happens, what kind of things to watch out for, the more we can tool people up with the tools they need to be able to stop themselves from getting scammed in the first place. Well, that's what you do really well on Scam Interceptors on the BBC. Fantastic show. Can you explain a little bit about it, what your role is on that? So I co-present the show with Rav Wild and essentially we are able to monitor live scams. So we work with an ethical hacker called Jim Browning, who's a brilliant man, has a fantastic YouTube channel called Tech Support Scams. Jim basically helps us to be able to see into the back end of what scam call centers do. And scam call centers use a very insecure way, shall we say, of making calls, which is that they use VoIP, which is called Voice Over Internet Protocol, to dial into the UK. And we're able to tap in to their back end, and we can basically listen to the calls that they're making. And that, in the room, basically allows us to use investigative journalism to work out who it is that they're talking to. So if we start with a phone number, maybe we can pick up some details in the call. Certain call centers, we can also see their computer screens. And what that means is we can see the remote access that they like to use to get into their victim's phones and computers. And once we can see a victim's phone or computer, we can find out who they are very quickly indeed. The end goal of all of that is to talk to that person, to stop them from being scammed, either by talking to them, by talking to a family member. We just got to try and stop them from paying out before it happens. And I like to say that we've slightly kind of flipped the way that journalists are able to cover scams. Because in my whole career up until doing this show, I've been an investigative documentary maker for some years, we've only ever been able to tell the story of scam victims retrospectively. So now we've created a situation in which we can actually tell them proactively and we can do something about it before it happens. And a beautiful cosmic irony in that you're using the scammer's own technology against them. And those quite simple bits of tech, but have only really been available in the last few years. Before we look at the future, can you explain kind of I suppose the last 10, 20 years, what has happened in scamming and what are those tools that they're using? So to be able to put into context how bad the problem with scam calls has got into the UK, you need to sort of roll back to about the late 90s. And in the late 90s, a lot of big Western businesses decided it would be a great idea to outsource their legitimate customer support to places like South Asia, where there was cheap labour, high proficiency in IT and good English speaking, people who were cheaper to employ than they would if they had to employ the same people at home. What they did by doing that was obviously created a huge industry, particularly in India, of what they call business process outsourcing, which is basically a tech industry that runs parts of businesses for cheaper than they could do if they were doing it at home. Unfortunately, by the time the late noughties came around, quite a lot of the public over here and in the US as well decided they didn't really like that. And they reflected that back to the companies who were doing it and said, we're not sure we like this, please can you change it? Now that created a huge problem because suddenly lots of other businesses said, oh, maybe we're also going to pull our business out of South Asia and bring it back to home-based call centres. That left a whole generation of people in South Asia who had learned how to run call centres, who had customer data, because bear in mind this was pre-GDPR, there wasn't really necessarily any rules about how that customer data that was there had to be stored, and they had no jobs. So of course, criminals came along and said, tell you what, we'll give you jobs, we'll create scam call centers, we'll use a lot of that customer data, and we'll employ all of you and pay you better probably in many cases than those businesses did before. What I think we should potentially be looking at as a country is licensing call centers that are not in the UK. So if you imagine there are lots of businesses still who have offshore legitimate call centers in places like the Philippines, They've moved into different parts of the world, but essentially most big businesses don't want their UK customers to know if they've got a call centre that's abroad. So they spoof, and that is muddying the waters slightly, right? In fact, it's muddying the waters a lot. If Ofcom said to them, all right, you guys want to have call centres outside the UK, you want to spoof your numbers, that's fine, but you've got to pay us to do it, and we're going to make a database of every legitimate call centre that does this. You can use voice over internet protocol to call into Britain, you can spoof a UK number, that's fine. 
But everyone outside of that who is not on this list, banned. No more voice over internet protocol calls, spoofing UK numbers if they're not on our pre-agreed registered list of people who are paying for the right to do it. That, I'm pretty confident, would eliminate a vast majority of scam calls tomorrow. How would you enforce it? Sorry, I'm just being the lawyer in the room. <laughs> no, that's a really good question. <laughs> There's a technological solution to enforce it, which is essentially, as I understand it, a switch that you can flip. So you could say, basically, you've got an exclusion list. These VoIP accounts are allowed to call into the UK with spoof numbers. Anything outside of that is just automatically flagged instantly and banned. But there's even a problem with that, which is that if you spoof a UK mobile, that's going to cause a problem because then it goes into the realm of the mobile providers who need people to be able to ring from abroad when they're roaming. So then what you've got to do is say to the mobile providers, if someone isn't roaming and they're claiming to call from abroad using a UK mobile number that is with your network, can you block it, please? So there's always going to be a way around for the scammers. That's the problem. It's a bit of an arms race. Of course, uh, phone calls are what sound like a bit of an old-fashioned way of being approached for a scam. A lot of this is happening online. Where are those kind of scams coming in from and what technologies help that? So I think we're seeing a really interesting shift, which is a shift towards scams that take place via text. Mm be that on WhatsApp or Telegram or initially via text message or dating apps or your social media. And there's a reason for that. And it's language. Of course, if you're talking to someone on the phone, it's very important that you're able to speak the same language as them at the moment. But if you're having an entire scam conversation via text, there are now tools out there that mean your potential victim is the whole world. Right. It's more than just Google Translate. Yes. So I've seen a thing called Hello World, which is a Chinese developed app. And it's interesting that it's Chinese developed because the example I saw it in was a, a scam that was being run by Chinese organized crime. And this particular type of scam is called pig butchering. It's where you start with what seems like a romantic or a sort of friendly approach, and then it ends up after weeks or months down the road into a crypto investment scam. It's such a gruesome name. Yes. And I'm not going to try and say the Chinese word that it comes from, but it starts with S and it ends in N and it means butchering pigs because the idea being that you fatten up the pig and then you take it for everything that it has. I've got my phone out now because I'm going to show you both something if that's okay. Oh, yes. This came directly from a whistleblower inside a pig butchering operation, which is actually in Dubai. And this person lived and worked inside one of four high rises, all of which were dedicated to pig butchering. So we estimated that there might be up to a thousand people working for this particular organization. Wow. The nature of these pig butchering operations is such that unfortunately a lot of the people who work for them as scammers are effectively indentured labor. They can't mm. leave. And this one was no different. It's half an hour outside of Dubai. It's in the middle of the desert. A lot of the people who were working there as scammers didn't have transport, so they'd be bussed in and then essentially wouldn't be able to leave until they were bussed out again. So even though they weren't strictly speaking imprisoned or strictly speaking slaves, mm. they were essentially that. Because Where are you going to run to? What are you going to do? You can't yeah, leave. Yeah, to all intents and purposes, they have no option. No, indeed. And this particular place had a double benefit for the people who ran it, um, which we believe, again, was Chinese organised crime. And that was that it meant they could see a police raid coming from miles away because they were in the middle of the desert. This one I wanted to show you because it has a particular element to it that I just found so unbelievably shocking, which was that these guys had a model who'd taken all the photos for them and who they had a constant supply of pictures and photos from. A lot of our advice is, you know, do a reverse image search on uh, an image that you've been sent or, or asked to do a video call. Yeah. And in the case of this particular group, the model lived in the high rise. That's some insidious stuff, isn't it? So what that meant is they could do things like this, which is where a victim's calling the model, having a video call with her. Yeah. And she's going to answer her phone and actually have a chat with this guy. And, uh, you know, she is basically just in a pretty bare room, sitting on a bed, having a nice chat with someone who thinks that this is the love of their life across the world. She's a real person. And that's the point at which I thought... How could you possibly ever know you're being scammed? Yeah. You'd have no way of knowing up until the point where they say, please start investing in cryptocurrency with me. But at that point, you might have been talking to them for months. Mm. These guys' script was made to last for weeks. And that is all about building trust and window dressing and getting the people you're talking to to really buy into what you're saying. And even when they first made the suggestion of investing in cryptocurrency, it was very much sort of blasé. Yeah. Like, oh, here's a thing I do. And no pressure was applied. 
And then a few days later, they'd mention it again and then mention it again. And then the person sort of thinks it up themselves effectively. So I just don't know how you're supposed to know that you're being scammed in that situation. I don't think I was ever expecting to see a real person who you could actually talk to. And the thing is, they must have to schedule that. They must have to fix it because they can't have her talking to every single person Mm. all the time. She won't have enough hours in the day. No, that's it. But I mean, she was being paid quite handsomely. I've seen the, the sort of pay structure and she was being paid quite handsomely to be there eight hours a day on call so that she could just take photos, do videos videos and then do video chats with people who were getting really suspicious so they could get them over the line. And it's worth saying about that lot as well, just in terms of how much money they actually had. Their operation was so big that they ran out of bandwidth. So what did they do? They paid for a 5G truck to be parked outside their four towers at all times. And that 5G truck you can see on Google Maps. It's a massive flatbed with a huge radio array on the back of it. That is how much money that group had. This is crazy. I feel like this is the cutting edge of, of technology. We still haven't really talked about the future. We've not talked about AI yet. We're going to take a quick break. But afterwards, we are going to be talking to an actual AI scam. Don't go away. Like listening to podcasts just like this one from the team at Witch? Well, we've got some good news. All our podcasts are now available to listen to on YouTube and YouTube Music. So whether you like listening to Get Answers, Witch Shorts or Witch Money, all episodes can now be listened to directly on YouTube or through the YouTube Music app. To find them, just search for the podcast you'd like to listen to. YouTube's additional functionality also means that you can now read along with subtitles as you listen. Don't panic though. All which podcasts are still available to listen to elsewhere too. So wherever you listen, we'll see you soon. We know the value of voting Democratic when our votes count. It's important that you save your vote for the November election. We'll need your help in electing Democrats up and down the ticket. Voting this Tuesday only enables the Republicans in their quest to elect Donald Trump again. So in case you hadn't guessed, that was an AI deepfake voice of Joe Biden used in an actual robocall in actual primary elections in the States. Really quite scary. I mean, I think that's one of the scariest uses of AI. But actually, it's not just happening in the US. It's not just happening to, you know, major world leaders. It is happening in the UK for quite boring scams about insulation. Nick, you've brought with us one of those scams. Yeah, I got tipped off about this the other day, and I'm quite fascinated by it. So it's probably the best scammer AI I've ever heard. And I've tried by talking to it to trip it up. And I really actually didn't manage to do it in a way that I think would have blown its cover to anybody else who was trying to talk to it. Well, we wanted to speak to them live right now, but it seems that scams move on quite quickly. The phone number is now dead. But luckily, I spoke to them earlier in the week. Take a listen. Hello? Hello? Oh, hiya. Hello there. Hi, my name's Joe, and I'm one of the energy advisors covering your area. We're contacting homeowners there, making sure that they... You're the homeowner there, are you? Yeah. It's about your insulation material in the attic. Some of it has now been classed irritant by the British Lung Foundation. So everybody's entitled to have a loft inspection to check it out and make sure it's not causing any problems. It's a completely free service. So would you like to take advantage of the free inspection to make sure your insulation is safe and working well? What could the loft insulation do? Um, you will get a call. When I put this appointment through, it will be allocated to one of the registered surveyors. You'll get a call in 15 to 30 minutes, I'd say, from who do our confirmations and allocations. They're um, a private company, not part of our government scheme, where, where there's grants available or anything like that. But they will be able to tell you exactly who is coming. They'll confirm the day, the time, and they will give you the name of the surveyor that's coming so that you can um, check, for, you know, for security reasons, you can check their ID on the doorstep, okay? Uh, I need to go on holiday tomorrow. No, no problem. Got to put you in an age bracket, the 45 to 79. 
yeah, 107. It is incredible. I mean, we couldn't reach it then live because we think it's probably just been shut down. Yeah. But from that recording, she was a bit stilted. I was a bit stilted, to be honest. That sounds like a lot of conversations I've had with people at call centres. And if you were in a in a rush, if you're out on the go, you had a bad line, you could be convinced into thinking that that was a real person and that they've booked in an appointment for your loft installation. She was just vague enough, wasn't yes. she? Yes. Oh, I'm... The energy advisor, not from where, not anything about what energy company, nothing like that, just the energy advisor. And let's be honest, everyone's out looking at energy issues at the moment. Energy's really high on the agenda for everyone. That was worrying. To be honest, I did worry that you might have been the AI. (laughs) Yeah, I I did sound unconvincing there as a human being. I failed the Turing test. It does happen. Yeah. I mean, Nick, what is the advantage really for a scammer to use something like that rather than just having someone on a call? Honestly, I think it's just overheads. If you imagine that if you're a scam business and you want to shift as much dodgy loft insulation as you possibly can, it's that or you pay for robocalls and you send out 100,000 robocalls in a day. Scam businesses are run like real businesses. There's no difference there. They're going to worry about their overheads. They're going to worry about how much it costs them to rent office space, how much it costs them to buy computers, how much it costs them to employ people. And if they can instead employ one AI who sounds like they might be a woman from South London in their 60s, then brilliant. And how much do we think that AI is going to cost? That's Any a very ideas? good question. I honestly don't have I don't have a handle on that at all. Wouldn't be surprised if it's all open source. Just free on the internet. Yeah, just free on the internet. I mean, it, it's I think of it as like a funnel almost in that you are trying to get people to that bottom of the funnel where you take their money. And that opening gambit being an AI conversation means that you can get someone's details, you've got them hooked and then follow up with a call presumably with an actual human being and then follow up with a real life conversation and maybe you're kind of three or four layers layers down before the con actually begins before you say i would like your money now please but you know the genius of that as well is that the ai is the one doing the lying (laughs) yeah so once you get the person in your house selling you the loft insulation the lies have already happened and if you're a victim of this what are you going to say to the police or what are you going to say to trading standards? You're going to say, oh, a person called me up from this number and they told me X, Y and Z. Well, where's your evidence of that? Ultimately, by that point, you're going to have loft insulation in your house already that you didn't need or want. I just I, I struggle with with how the authorities are going to be able to, to deal with that. And what is your advice to make sure that who you're talking to either is an actual human being or is some particular human being? They are your son or daughter. I think if you if you if suspect you're talking to an AI, asking it what your name is is probably quite a good one because it's highly unlikely to have that data at its disposal and very unlikely to be even more so to be able to find out. But I think beyond that, if you want to be sure that the person you're talking to is who they say they are, for example, if it is a family member or something like that, having a code question. Mm-hmm. So some piece of information that only that family member could know, which allows you to kind of be sure that you're talking to that person. I think is a very the only way I would start having, for example, a financial conversation with a family member if they're calling from a number I don't recognise. Yeah. So, for example, you could say, I don't know, what was the name of next door neighbour's cat when we were growing up? Yeah, exactly right. I have one set up with my dad, which relates to the first game of football that we ever went to because I got so paranoid about this. I thought it was time to do it. But is it paranoia? If you're seeing this happening all the time, is it really that you're paranoid or are you actually just being prepared? Maybe you're right. I think it maybe is necessary now. Is it also useful to just call back the number that you expect to hear from? So if someone calls you from a number you don't recognise, just hang up and call the number you would expect to hear from them on. That's the classic advice I'd say to people with high mum scams, generally speaking, is basically if you're getting something out of the blue, purporting to be from your child, saying, oh, I've smashed my phone, contact me on this number, just try them on the original number first, because they'll often find out very, very quickly that way that nothing's wrong and everything's okay and you don't need to pay £5,000. So I think that's a very, very good bit of advice, yeah. I mean, hopefully that wasn't too pessimistic. There are solutions out there. I mean, which has been really big the last few years on the Online Safety Act, trying to put responsibility on social media companies so that they are responsible for scam ads being put on their platforms. We won that battle. We remains to be seen how it actually works in, in real life. We've been fighting for the right to reimbursement if you lose money through banking scams. Hopefully that will help people out quite a bit. Do you think things like the Online Safety Act are enough? And do you think big tech companies are going to start pulling their weight? I think the chances of getting big tech companies to pull their weight on this anytime in the near future are quite slim because they're basically too big to have to care. 
on a national level, do I think that we could be doing better in educating people about scams? Yes. I think the Stop Think Fraud campaign is great, but the horses bolted some time ago and I'm worried that this is just way too little too late. I think we need to do a much better job of of getting people to understand how serious a problem this is and protecting themselves against it. So we mentioned earlier on about what we're doing at Witch and we can't really go for a whole show without mentioning our free weekly scam alert service. So what we do, we take all the latest scams doing the rounds right now along with the best advice and put it into a weekly email to keep you safe. Over 450,000 people are signed up and last year we estimate it saved 1.8 million quid. That would have been lost to scam. I'll pop a link in the description for today's show. And we'll also put a link to our Scam Alert Facebook community too. Then we'll keep you up to date with the latest scams and give you a chance to share your own experiences to help ensure other people don't fall victim. I subscribe to the email, by the way. I love Good. It. I think there's two halves to being scam proof. Half of it is recognising a particular scam and being aware of something, doing the rounds. That's very easy to do if you can see the connection with something that you've read online or in an email. But there are too many scams to be able to know about all of them. There's too much evolving tech. Is there a piece of advice that you've got which is eternal and universal? Is there anything that we should be doing more that can keep us safer? I think the depressing but ultimately correct piece of advice that I have to give is to say to everybody that absolutely anything that comes completely out of the blue is to be viewed as a scam until proven otherwise. And I want people to be better at verifying and to pausing and thinking, hang on a minute, do I need to do a bit of further investigation here? Because whether it's a phone call, text message, message on social media, message on a dating app, whatever it might be, I think we've reached the point where we just need to go, this person's probably a scammer and I'm going to make sure that they're not before I proceed. And I think that advice is great. And I think it's also just, you could have given that to someone in a town in the Wild West in 1820. If someone new comes to town and offers you, you know, the elixir of life, you've got to be doubtful. The biggest problem is that I think a lot of people think that for some reason the internet is some kind of safe space. And that because there's people who take responsibility for certain parts of it, like social media platforms, whatever it is, when they're doing things in that place, they are safe. But the reality is it isn't. It's like the world. You would never go and buy something from a shop where you couldn't see what the shop was. You couldn't see what the shop, who the shopkeeper was or see any of their previous customers. And yet people go online and buy from social media profiles, which are ultimately completely anonymous and you have no idea who's behind them. So I just think taking a bit of that real life stuff and applying it to the online world is probably the best thing that most of us can do. Thank you so much, Nick. It's been fantastic having you on the show today. Where can people find you on socials and where can they watch your show? So I am Staple Nick in almost all places, the first half of my surname and then my name. And the show is on BBC iPlayer. It's also going out at the moment at half past eight on BBC One on Monday nights. And the new series will be on in the spring. Well, huge thank you for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on soon. Thanks very much. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to get in touch with us and have your message read out on our next episode, then we're on email at podcasts at witch.co.uk and at witchuk on socials. That's where you can go to watch some brilliant videos of what we've been getting up to here on the podcast. Please also leave us a rating and a review wherever you're listening. And a reminder, you can now listen to all our brilliant witch podcasts over on YouTube and YouTube Music too. So, Harry, what are you up to next? Well, this is a favourite of mine. We're going to talk about food. This time looking at food delivery apps and a biggie, it's restaurant sustainability. Just how green is your favourite place to eat? We'll tell you more. Interestingly, I did work on that investigation recently. And you remember at the top of the show, I mentioned there are loads of organisations out there that don't like what we say. I think you're going to be in for a treat next time. A whole lot of right of replies. And remember, if you want more great stuff to listen to before then, check out the Witch Money Pod for your personal finances. And we've got the best stories from Witch Magazine narrated for you over on Witch Shorts. Today's Get Answers was presented by me, Harry Kind, alongside Lisa Webb, produced and recorded by Rob Lilly-Jones, and edited by Eric Breer. And thanks again to our wonderful guest, Nick Stapleton. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. You've probably heard of Witch Magazine, our home of hard-hitting journalism and informative stories delivered directly to our members. There's our travel, money, and tech mags too. But did you know you can hear some of our best articles for free, available to listen to whenever you like? Each week on the Witch Shorts podcast, 
we bring you a specially selected story, lovingly voiced and produced especially for you on a whole range of fascinating topics. Just search Rich Shorts wherever you're listening.